Hello, shalom, and welcome to this episode of Congressional Conversations, where we discuss the priorities of New York's Jewish community with members of the New York Congressional Delegation. I'm your host, Michael Miller, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the Jewish Community Relations Council of New York, JCRCNY, and today, hailing from the 15th Congressional District in my home borough of the Bronx, we welcome Representative Richie Torres. Representative Torres is the vice chair, as a freshman, is a vice chair of the House Committee on Homeland Security. On the subcommittees on cybersecurity infrastructure protection and innovation, as well as oversight, management, and accountability. Another committee that he serves on is the Committee on Financial Services and on that committee's subcommittees on housing, community development, and insurance, as well as consumer protection and financial institutions. He is a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, the LGBTQ plus Equality Caucus, and the Congressional Progressive Caucus. A lot of caucuses that this congressman is a member of. Welcome, Congressman Torres. It's an honor to be here. And I just want to say it's it's I'm so sad to see you go. You've been, you've had a transformative impact uh, on my life uh, and the same could be said of your impact on the city. Uh, you're one of the few people in public life who rise to the level of a statesman. And um, oh, I'm just a you. better person for having known you and I'm just enormously grateful to be here. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I still thank God will be serving as CEO Emeritus and uh, hopefully we'll still be around, although not in the capacity that I'm current, currently in. And it's really been an honor and a pleasure to get to know you as well and your councilmatic role and, and now uh, rising to the level of being a, a United States uh, member of the House of Representatives. It's really incredible. Um, I know a lot about you, but our viewers might not. So let, let's find out about who Richie Torres actually is uh, where you grew up and why you decided to, to run for Congress and particularly uh, regarding uh, public housing and how that has played such a pivotal role uh, in your public life. Well, the starting point for me is the Bronx. Um, I'm a proud son of the Bronx, born and raised. Uh, I think of myself as born, bred and battle scarred, <laughs> proud of the Bronx. And the most formative experience of my life uh, was gr growing up in public housing. Um, as you know, public housing in New York City has been so systematically underfunded at every level of government, especially at the federal level, that it has a capital need of $40 billion in counting. Uh, and so like many in public housing, I grew up in conditions of mold and mildew, leaks and lead uh, without consistent heat and hot water in the winter. You know, I tell people my life is something of a metaphor. Uh, I grew up in a public housing development right across the street from what ultimately became Trump Golf Course. Uh, <laughs> Golf Course uh, was undergoing construction. It, it actually unleashed a skunk infestation. So I jokingly tell people I've been smelling the stench of Donald Trump <laughs> before he became president. Um, but at the time, the government had invested more than $100 billion in a golf course for Donald Trump. And I remember wondering to myself, why would we invest more in a golf course than in the homes of low-income New Yorkers? You know, none of us can succeed without stable, permanent housing. Uh, and so I've made it my mission to be a champion of, of poor people in public housing. Um, you know, I ultimately won a city council seat on the strength of door-to-door -door campaigning. And after seven years in the city council, I came to realize there was a limit to what I could do at the local level. You know, much of what we do at the local and state level is essentially the administration of federal programs and priorities. And I came to understand that if I want to be a transformational policymaker, if I want to have a systemic impact in improving public housing and people's lives, I have to be in Washington, D.C., because that's where the rules are set. That's where the purse strings are held. Uh, that's where the future of the country is largely determined. And for me, Congress is a natural progression from the New York City Council, because as a former council member, I have an on the ground knowledge of how federal policies operate at the local level. Yeah, well, uh, that really is, is, is crucial being on the floor 
of the House of Representatives as these issues are, are being uh, deliberated on, particularly on the committee level. Uh, let's talk about a, another uh, aspect of, of who you are. You're, you're also openly gay and you have been a very strong supporter of the Equality Act. Um, I'm just curious as to whether you in, endured harassment uh, growing up in, in, in public housing um, uh, for, for uh, being gay and how that impacts as well on the advocacy role that you're currently uh, playing to ensure equality for uh, gay, uh, gay Americans. Well, I spent almost all my childhood in the closet uh, for fear of violence. You know, I grew up in public housing um, and I was afraid to come out um, mm. the, the rough and tumble of life in the Bronx. The first time I ever acknowledged my sexuality was at age 16. Um, and I did not fully come out to everyone until um, I ran for the city council at age 24. Really? Um, so, you know, I, for me, there's no greater enemy of freedom than fear. You know, wherever there's fear, there can never be freedom. And I want to live in a country where every American, regardless of your sexual orientation or gender identity, can live freely without the fear of ostracism or violence. Yes, and, and employment. Um, and I think that, if I'm not mistaken, that's what the Equality Act is really targeting, um, is, is uh, equal employment, protection and employment. So the Equality Act uh, would expand the scope of the Civil Rights Act to protect the LGBTQ community from discrimination, not only in matters of employment, but also in matters of housing, public accommodations, every aspect of life. It's, it's the most sweeping legislation uh, in the service of LGBTQ equality in the history of the United States. And the Equality Act is based on the simple proposition that no American should be fired or evicted or denied essential services or accommodations simply because of who you are or whom you love. Uh, it's a codification of equality for every American. Yes, um, speaking about e equality, uh, part of your who you are, your identity is, is Puerto Rican um, and you, you are in favor of uh, equality for Puerto Rico um, taking on statehood um, as opposed to its uh, current status. Uh, can, can you explain to our, our viewers why that's so important to you? So, you know, the debate around Puerto Rico provokes uh, strong emotions from all sides. But, but I start the debate with a simple question, with a simple observation. Puerto Ricans are American citizens and have been for more than a century. And if Puerto Ricans are American citizens, why not make them equal under the law, right? The solution to inequality is equality, which can only be conferred by statehood. And if most Puerto Ricans on the island wish to remain American citizens, which has been borne out by multiple plebiscites and polls, then there are only two options from which to choose. There's the status quo, which is essentially colonialism, and then there's statehood, which represents legal equality. You know, a wise person once said, "You cannot have a seat at the table if you're not if you if you're not on the if you if you don't have a seat at the table, then you're probably on the menu." <laughs> statehood represents a seat at the table, right? Statehood would mean that Puerto Rico has two U.S. senators and five members of Congress. It would mean billions of dollars in new federal funding for critical needs like healthcare. It would mean more representation and more resources. It would objectively improve life on the island. And, and you know, even though there are differences of opinion as to status, we all share the same goal, right? We all want more resources for Puerto Rico. Statehood would lead to more resources for Puerto Rico. Right? Even those who oppose statehood are calling for the abolition of the Financial Control Board statehood would abolish the Financial Control Board mm -hmm. because under American federalism, states, unlike colonies, have rights, have sovereignty. And the federal government is prohibited by the United States Constitution from imposing a Financial Control Board that infringes on the sovereignty of a state. So there's no doubt in my mind, but, but the most important argument yes. for statehood is this. In November of 2020, 
the majority of the Puerto Rican electorate voted for statehood through a plebiscite. And when the people have spoken, we in Congress have an obligation to legislate what the people voted for. That to me is true democracy, self-determination and decolonization. Follow the will of the people on the island. And what are the prospects uh, in, in the Congress at, the, at this time? The prospects are challenging, not only because there's deep division within the Democratic caucus in the House, uh, but the, the Senate is essentially a graveyard for the priorities of the House. Um, as long as the filibuster remains a fact of life, mm. uh, I have trouble imagining a path to statehood for either DC or Puerto Rico. Huh. So uh, back to the issue of, of e equality and, and uh, equality of access, uh, COVID. Uh, COVID-19 has, has ravaged uh, New York and particularly the Bronx. Um, what have you been able to do on behalf of your constituents to ensure that their needs are provided for, whether it's uh, PPE, um, or more importantly at this juncture is vaccines? And what is the rate of vaccination? Are there anti-vaxxers? Are the people who are afraid of the vaccination? And what's the status uh, in, in, in your district? Yeah, so as you know, the, the South Bronx was hit the earliest and hardest by COVID-19. Um, you know, at one point the unemployment rate in parts of the South Bronx could be as high as 25%. There were hundreds of thousands of Bronx residents who were and are in danger of facing uh, eviction. Um, and so given the magnitude of the crisis confronting the Bronx and the rest of the city and the rest of the country, uh, the Democratic caucus in the, in the House passed the American Rescue Plan because our view was that we had more to fear from doing too little than from doing too much. Right. If we had done too little or nothing, it would have taken us a year longer mm. to return to pre-pandemic levels of employment. It would have taken us three years longer to return to pre-pandemic levels uh, of economic growth. And the most important initiative in the American Rescue Plan was the child tax credit. Right? The need to fight child poverty has taken on a new urgency during COVID-19. So before the American Rescue Plan, the structure of the child tax credit, which is a tax credit for families with children, was so regressive that it left behind a third of American children, 27 million children, the poorest children in the country. And no community was more left behind than mine, the South Bronx, where two thirds of children were excluded from the full benefit of the child tax credit. Right? The expansion of the child tax credit under the American Rescue Plan cuts child poverty in half. I represent the poorest congressional district in America, and there is no policy that has done more to lift my district out of poverty than the expanded child tax credit, uh, which is the most powerful argument for the American Rescue Plan. How long is it going to take for the American Rescue Plan uh, to really take have an impact uh, in, in the district? I wasn't aware that you represent the, the, the poorest congressional district in the country. Um, and how do you measure that? What are the metrics? Well, there's an official federal poverty line and, you know, my district, I mean, there's poverty everywhere, but uh, I have one of the most compressed, compact uh, geographic districts in the country. And there are heavy concentrations of, of poverty, particularly racially concentrated poverty. Uh, there are, you know, Americans have already received the stimulus checks, the one time, what, $1,400 payment. Um, my understanding is Americans are going to start receiving the child tax credit payments beginning in July. Mm -hmm. It is our hope that those payments are going to be structured on a monthly basis. Uh, most tax credits tend to be dispersed annually. The yeah. child tax credit ought to be dispersed monthly because we have monthly expenses. Right. Uh, it's much more convenient for families and it's much more stimulative of the economy. Right. If, if, if you're receiving up to $300 per child every month, you are, as a working person, are gonna spend those dollars right. at local businesses. And you're not only creating income for those businesses, you're creating income for the, 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 the workers who are employed by those businesses. So it's not only good morals, but it's also good economics. 
Right, and certainly it's very important for budgeting uh, rather than getting a lump sum and you might be enticed to, to buy something which you really shouldn't. Uh, in this instance, if you were to get it on a monthly basis, you'd be absolutely uh, correct. But let's talk about that. Uh, go ahead. Just one quick point. The, I think the, the value of the tax credit is fungibility. You know, you can only use nutritional assistance to address your nutritional needs. You know, the needs of families varies widely. And with the child tax credit, you can decide how to put those dollars to use. You can use it for healthcare. You could use it for prescription drugs. You could use it for transportation or food. So the fungibility is a real benefit to families who have widely varied needs. Well, speaking about, uh, thank you. Th speaking about children, uh, you just joined the Broadband Access Task Force uh, with all the other caucuses and committees that you're serving on. Uh, this uh, seems to be a very important one for your district. Uh, what would broadband access mean uh, for particularly the children uh, within your district? Yeah, so I'm a member of uh, the Majority Whip's uh, Jim Clyburn's Task Force on Broadband, uh, which is proposing legislation that would invest $100 billion in, in broadband infrastructure. You know, our view is that broadband is to the 21st century what electrification was to the 20th century. And you know, we're in the midst of an FDR moment and we should harness the power of this moment to invest in greater broadband to an extent that we have not seen before. You know, COVID-19 held up a mirror to the deepest inequalities in our society. And the inequality that weighed most heavily on families uh, was the digital divide. We saw during COVID-19 the digital divide deny our students their fundamental right to an education. You know, when we made the transition from in-person instruction to remote learning, it became glaringly obvious that not every child had access to the internet and not every child with internet access had an electronic tablet at home. And so there were children who were deprived of an education to which they are legally entitled. And my concern is that the loss of learning during COVID-19 is going to have profound consequences that will endure long after the pandemic is gone. Uh, so we have to ensure that every child in America has access to high speed, high quality internet. Uh, the numbers in New York City are staggering. 30% um, of New York City ha has no access to broadband at home. And among the lowest income neighborhoods, the rate is as high as 50%. And to be disconnected from the internet is to be disconnected from healthcare in a world of telehealth. And it is to be disconnected from education in a world of remote learning. No, ab absolutely. Um, and, and now with uh, snow days, uh, uh, no longer being days off as opposed to uh, virtual learning. Uh, in order to do virtual learning, you have to have broadband access. You have to be on the, on the internet. Uh, so that, that's really crucial. But there's a flip side uh, to um, the internet and, and that's uh, cyber uh, security issues. Um, and we have seen in, in the Jewish community um, but in all faith communities and in all communities, um, this new phenomenon of, of Zoom bombing and many other attempts uh, to try to invade the space of, of uh, well-meaning individuals, particularly faith groups. Um, we've seen it with synagogue uh, services. We saw it with the uh, North Shore Hebrew Academy and uh, Nazi propaganda, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you're the, the vice chair of, of the House um, a committee on, on Homeland Security. Um, what can we hope to expect that the federal government can do um, with the frame, within the framework of, of the internet to be protective of our freedoms, yes, uh, but to be protective of, of us and our sensibilities? Um, well, for me, the, the single most important issue that has been neglected is cybersecurity. Mm. Um, you know, most Americans are aware that we're facing the greatest economic crisis since the Great Depression, the greatest public health crisis since the Spanish flu. Uh, what is not so well known is that we're facing the greatest cybersecurity crisis, the solar winds breach uh, of the federal government, which was likely driven by, by Russia. And every year, the director of national intelligence testifies that the greatest threat to America's national security, to all of our homeland security, 
is coming largely from cyberspace, from nation states in particular, like Russia, China, North Korea, and not shockingly, Iran. Uh, these are countries that are conducting offensive operations against the United States uh, every day, and it's costing us um, billions of dollars. Uh, I think the lesson learned from solar winds, the solar winds breach of the federal government, is that we have to do more to invest in our own cyber defenses. Uh, so we have a system of defense known as Einstein, which is effective at detecting and preventing attacks based on a database of known cyber threats. But many of the threats that, are, that we're facing are unknown. So we have to develop the capacity to detect and prevent what are known as anomalous cyber attacks mm -hmm. on, on our critical systems. Uh, so this is an issue of homeland security and national security, and we have to invest more in our cyber infrastructure. Uh, there are state and local governments, there are financial institutions, there are hospitals that are highly susceptible to cyber attacks, particularly ransomware, uh, where I'm about to have a hearing. Uh, I said on the subcommittee on cybersecurity on the Homeland Security Committee, and we're about to have a hearing on ransomware. Uh, according to cybersecurity ventures, yes. uh, ransomware is projected to cost the world $10.5 trillion by 2025. So cyber crime has been on an exponential curve. It has gone from 3 trillion in 2015 to 6 trillion in 2021 to 10.5 trillion in 2025. Wow. And almost all of cyber crime goes unpunished. According to Third Way, less than 1% of cyber crime results in enforcement action. That, that's extraordinary and, and that's uh, very distressing to hear. Um, is that your priority within the Homeland Security uh, Committee, uh, the issue of cybersecurity? It, for me, it is, it is the issue that I feel is the most important and most neglected at the same time, and it's ripe for bipartisan, bicameral compromise. Um, right. There's nothing, uh, Fiorello LaGuardia famously said, there's no Republican or Democratic way to take out the trash. Mm. Um, I would make the same argument for cybersecurity. There's no Democratic or Republican way to bolster America's cybersecurity. It's, it's an issue that should bring us all together. Right, and speaking of bringing us all together, we've seen a spate of anti-Semitism, I, I know you're aware of, and most recently anti-Asian hatred, of course, uh, the George Floyd uh, killing and, and racism. Um, is there a role that you'll be playing in, in that space um, as uh, a voice of trying to bring communities together um, I think what's most needed is, is education, but particularly uh, having spokespersons such as, as yourself uh, being out there and building coalitions. Look, the, I think those of us who are in elected office have an obligation to use our platforms to speak out against extremism in every form. I have spoken out against anti-Semitism. I've spoken out against racism. I've spoken out against sentiment against the AAPI community and will continue to do so. And there's a critical role for the Department of Homeland Security to play yes. in cracking down on extremism and hate crimes. You know, we provide a grant known as the Non-for-Profit Security Grant to institutions that are at high risk of hate crimes and violence and, and domestic terrorism. And the Jewish community in particular is heavily dependent on those grants. And I'm gonna fight for an expansion of the program because it's been remarkably effective. Right? You, you, know, you can only depend on the police so much, you have to empower communities with the tools to defend themselves. Uh, and the Not-for-Profit Security Grant Program uh, has been a resounding success. Well, uh, our Community Security Initiative, which is a partnership with UJA, our CSI has really been uh, instrumental in assisting Jewish institutions with the NSGP, the Not Nonprofit Security Grant Program. Can't thank you enough and your colleagues uh, for the support for it. Uh, it was $90 million this past year, is $180 million. And I think there's a, a strong sentiment that it should be doubled once again to $360 million dollars. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm very, very grateful on behalf of our organization, I'm sure on behalf of our community for the role that you have played in that regard. Uh, I, I want to consider we have limited time. I want to shift now to an issue on which you have 
really been a stalwart supporter, and that's the state of Israel. Um, I, I listened to, uh, thank you very much for sending it to me, I listened to your one minute speech on, on the floor uh, of, of the house, um, and it was very inspirational to me in support of Israel on Israel's Independence Day. Um, we very much uh, want to see um, Israel as a bipartisan issue, but before we get to the bipartisan issue, internal uh, to the Democratic Party, uh, particularly among, among progressives, um, we'd like to see that as an important issue for all. And uh, last time we spoke, you wanted to, to show that there can be a progressive position support of Israel and two states. So how's that going? I feel optimistic. Um, you know, I, I hope to represent a model of, of pro-Israel progressivism. And for me, it's not, it's insufficient to be pro-Israel in behind the scenes. Um, you know, we have to be vocal and visible, fearless and forceful in our advocacy in order to change the narrative, in order to combat the, the vicious lies um, that have been percolating at the expense of Israel. Um, you know, I found it heartening that a supermajority of the United States Congress signed on to a letter affirming their support for Israel and affirming their unwavering support for the security of Israel and the American-Israeli relationship. Uh, there is legislation in Congress uh, which proposes to effectively condition aid to Israel that has only marginal support. Uh, so there's no doubt in my mind that uh, the United States Congress in general and the Democratic Party in particular uh, remains fundamentally and overwhelmingly pro-Israel and making the issue bipartisan. So stepping across, you talked about that on the Homeland Security uh, Committee. Uh, what about the, the Israel issue? Have you been able to reach across the aisle to, uh, to colleagues in this regard? Uh, you know, we're living through a period of peak polarization in Washington, D.C., especially in the wake of uh, January 6th, but yes. support for Israel and support for the American-Israeli relationship uh, is one of the few areas of bipartisanship. Uh, and, and you know, the durability of support for Israel is built on a bedrock of bipartisanship. You know, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, whether you're a progressive or conservative, uh, we all have a vested interest in ensuring bipartisan support for Israel. Uh, thank you. And we, we thank you very much for the role that you're playing. Um, uh, you, you may be a, a freshman, you might be in your first uh, term, but you're not a backbencher. Uh, you have made sure that your, your voice uh, be heard, and uh, we're, we're uh, just exceedingly grateful uh, for that. Um, I'm not sure we, we would have had time to get, get this, but we have just a, a few more minutes. Uh, I just want to talk about the immigration issue for a moment, um, and, and particularly pertaining to, uh, to the border. Um, what are, are the, the real challenges at the border and what do you, have you been able to do thus far uh, to, to mitigate them? Look, the president inherited a broken system and it's, it's unreasonable to expect the president to build a whole new system overnight. Um, you know, it is easy to close the borders to everyone, including unaccompanied minors, which is what the Trump administration did. It is much harder but, but more humane to create a process by which we take in these unaccompanied minors and we reunite them with their families. Uh, but creating that process is going to take time. Uh, ultimately, this is not only about immigration, this is about humanitarianism. We have to address the root causes that, that's driving migration from Central America to the United States. You know, why are people embarking on a dangerous journey from Central America to the uh, U.S.-Mexico border? It's because there are challenges of violence and natural disaster in Central America, and we should provide humanitarian assistance that stabilizes those countries uh, in order to curb uh, the dangerous migration that has been unfolding. I mean, we have to address the root causes. Yeah, and, and one final question before we wrap up. Um, Going back to the, to the Middle East, you referenced Iran within the framework of, of cybersecurity, um, but the negotiations that are currently under underway uh, for the potential for the United States to step back into JCPOA. Uh, what would you like uh, as an outcome of uh, where our administration, the American administration is currently, um, and is the JCPOA redeemable? Uh, so, you know, there's a there's disagreement. There are some who would argue 
that we should pursue temporary, temporary denuclearization to the exclusion of everything else. Uh, there are others like myself who would argue that we need to address not only, we need to achieve not only permanent denuclearization, but also address concerns about Iran's cyber terrorism, yes. regional aggression, violation of human rights, state sponsorship of terrorism. You know, Iran has been objectively the driver of death and destruction uh, in the Middle East. It's, 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 it's had an outsized role in destabilizing the state system uh, in the Middle East, whether it's Yemen or Iraq or Lebanon or the, the support it has given to Hamas at the expense of the Palestinians and at the expense of Israel. Um, so the, the question I would have is, is this, um, the devil's in the details. Uh, you know, no one should uh, render judgment on an agreement without reviewing the details. Uh, but if the United States decides to lift sanctions on Iran, uh, where are those dollars going to go? If, if Iran is going to invest those dollars in its own people, in economic opportunity, in domestic infrastructure, I'm all for it. Right. If Iran is going to invest those dollars in terrorism that will come at the expense of Israel and the Sunni Arab world and the United States, um, then I, that would be cause for concern because America should not be in the business of subsidizing terrorism that threatens the security of our allies and the security of the United States. Um, and Iran's track record would suggest that it will continue to undercut stability and peace in the Middle East, and it will continue to undercut uh, the security of the United States. Thank you very much. Uh, we, I certainly wholeheartedly concur. Um, and that brings us to the end of, of, of our conversation. As always, every time I've had a conversation with you has been enlightening. Um, and this one certainly is no exception to that. Are there any last thoughts you'd like to, to leave with us before we part company? I, I owe you and JCRC a huge debt. Um, you know, going to Israel twice, once in 2015 and 2018, were among the most transformative experiences of my life. And I, I would not be who I am as a public servant were it not for the generosity of JCRC. So thank you having me a, a lifelong friend. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, feelings are, are quite mutual. Uh, so thank you so much, Congressman, for joining us on this program. Uh, to our audience, thank you for watching. And if you wanna learn more about some of the issues we discussed today with Congressman uh, Richie Torres, you can please check out JCRC's website and our 2021 Focus on Communal Priorities. It's available at jcrcny.org. Uh, look forward to seeing you next time on, con on Congressional Conversations. And once again, our, our heartfelt thanks uh, and gratitude to Congressman Richie Torres, not only for being on this program, but for the outstanding leadership, leadership he has shown uh, in the United States House of Representatives. Thank you all very much. Uh, shalom and look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.